Hi, I'm Beryl, and the theme for today's video is fried food. Today, we are going to learn about five different fried foods from five different countries. I do think that we need to do more than one episode under this theme because fried food, right? So leave a comment with a dish that you'd like to see and what country it's from. But for now, let's get started with today's episode. Hi Beryl, my name is Andrea and I live in Ontario, Canada, but I'm originally from Peru. The dish I'd like to share with you today is picarones. Picarones are a fried dough that is similar to a donut. They're round with a hole in the center, but what's so unique about them is that they're made from squash and sweet potato and served with a spiced syrup. The syrup is often made from chancaca, which is like a solid brick of brown sugar that's cooked down with orange peel, cinnamon, and cloves and poured over top. This dish is very special to me because growing up in Canada with most of my family in Peru, being together is something that didn't happen often. So this dish reminds me of those special trips to Peru when I was young, being with my grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins for the first time in many years. I think you should try this dish because the complexity of flavors, the anise seed in the batter, the squash of the sweet potato, the molasses flavor of the chancaca, and the spices combine to make a very unique combination that's distinctly Peruvian. I really hope you enjoy, and thank you so much for trying this dish. I had to start with the picarones because the idea of this like pumpkin fried donut with a brown sugar citrus syrup. <laughs> yeah, the color of this is so pretty. Ha. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Because I put beer in it and it's a very like yeasted donut, you can kind of taste that like yeastiness, which makes it not feel so sweet. It's got almost like a savory element to it. But then, then you've got this brown sugar syrup and uh, whoo, this is <laughs> so good. This is something that I feel like I could mindlessly eat an entire plate of because it's not too sweet, but it's really crunchy. I really like that. We're gonna have a second one. So I thought it was really interesting in making these that you kind of tear it apart to form the donut shape, but then when you put it in the hot oil, you need to do something so that they don't close up. So I have this like spoon method where I was just sticking the spoon in the hot oil and like spinning them around it to keep the hole. I mean, it worked. Oh, wow. They're so soft on the inside and so crispy on the outside. It's just, just like the perfect type of bite. I don't know if I taste pumpkin that much in this. You can also make these using butternut squash puree, but we have canned pumpkin here in the US, so. That's what I went with. I do think though that it makes the color really beautiful. Maybe it adds a little nutritional content. I don't know. <laughs> this makes me feel all the ways that fried food makes you feel. Just kind of like, you know? This was uh, quite the way to start this episode. I am on a very high note right now. We're gonna give my deep fryer a rest for a minute and talk about the sponsor for today's video, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal delivery service and today I am making their pecan crusted chicken. Pecan, pecan, pecan. One of my favorite things about HelloFresh is the diversity in their meal choices. They have 40 weekly recipes to choose from so you don't get stuck in a cooking rut, which is something that I definitely do. And within those 40 weekly recipes, there are tons of individualized preferences. So if you are a vegetarian, if you need family friendly meals, or even adding a protein to a veggie dish, all of their ingredients come pre-portioned and the recipes are very easy to follow. And I think that even an inexperienced home cook can find amazing success with HelloFresh's meals. This dish was really quick to make and it looks really good. So let's try it. Cheers. Mmm, ooh, that's so nice. It's really cool that when I end up cooking HelloFresh meals, I do techniques that I would never normally do on my own, like this pecan, pecan crusted top would never probably make it. If you are interested in trying HelloFresh, and I recommend that you do, you can go to hellofresh.com, use my code BARREL65, and that will give you 65% off plus free shipping. 
All right, my deep fryer misses me. I'm coming. Hi, my name is Sara, and I was born and raised in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The recipe I want to share with you is called Muhogo Bhajiyas. Muhogo is the Swahili word for cassava, and bhajia is a Gujarati word that means basically any veggie that's deep fried. Muhogo bhajias are little ball-shaped fritters, crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside, like a pakora made of mainly mashed potatoes and grated cassava. The reason I love this is because of the super crunchy texture and the spices paired with the sweet chutney is so good, you can never have just one. It's an excellent evening snack with tea and a sure hit when you have guests over. This dish is more East African than Tanzanian, I would say. A lot of Indians have settled in these countries, especially Kenya and Tanzania. So there are a lot of influences of both cultures in our lives. Like bhajias is an Indian dish, but you will find it all across East Africa using African staples such as cassava and plantains. I think it's a beautiful product of when people accept and embrace each other's cultures and make things for the better. I don't really have any memories of this dish from my childhood, but the reason I like it is because it's a part of my mom's childhood that she shared with me. I think the reason the world loves fried food so much is because number one, it tastes better, and number two, it gives us that instant pleasure and happiness that one seeks. Whenever you are having a bad day, having something fried is an instant mood lifter. I think people should try this recipe because it's a great way to introduce people to Indo-Tanzanian cuisine, which is highly underrated. The taste of this dish will definitely make you go for seconds and thirds. I have had to source a lot of very interesting ingredients to make a lot of these recipes, but none have given me grief like cassava. I was able to find the powder easily, but like actual cassava, I went to five stores in the pouring rain uphill both ways. <laughs> but ultimately we succeeded. Ta-da! I'm very excited. This is going to be spicy. I like I know because of the, the hot chilies that went into it. Oh my god, so crunchy. And there's the spice. Oh my god. The tamarind is kind of helpful, I guess. Maybe not really helpful. I used a scotch bonnet chili because that's what I had. The recipe called for a habanero. And then I was thinking like, oh, scotch bonnet chilies are like way spicier, but turns out they're like kind of similar on the Scoville scale. Oh my god. My mouth is making so much saliva. While, while I was just talking, I felt like I was about to drown. <laughs> Oh, but it's good. It is very crunchy on the outside and really soft on the inside. To be honest, because it's so spicy, I can't really tell you what other flavors are happening in here, but I am enjoying it in like a kind of masochistic sort of way. I was asking myself the other day, like, why do I, and why do people in general want to increase their spice tolerance? Like, maybe it's your bragging rights to be like, huh, I can eat like ghost pepper chilies and I don't care. But for me, I feel like it's a way that I can partake in and actually enjoy other cuisines around the world because a lot of cuisines on this big, beautiful planet have spicy foods. And it's not spice for the sake of spice. It's spice because that is a part of the flavor palette. And like, if you need to eat everything just always toned down, I think you're gonna be missing out on a lot of things. So I think that my spice tolerance has increased on this channel, we're, but we're still, we're a work in progress. <laughs> I'm like in training right now on camera. I'm sweating. The texture though. Mm. It's just like a perfect texture. If you can easily access cassava and you like heat, I just like these were easy to make. The, it, they're, like, I mean, I don't know why I keep talking about the texture, but like they're amazingly textured, just like spongy and crunchy. Anyway, I don't remember what I was saying. My mouth is on fire. They're really good. They're just spicy. <laughs> hi, Beryl, and hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle, and I am from Chicago. I'm half English Irish and half Assyrian. And the dish I'd like to share with you all today is a dish from my Assyrian side called potato chop. 
Now, not many people know who Assyrians are, as we often do get confused as Syrians from Syria. But Assyrians are an ethnic group who live in the Middle East, but do not have a country in the modern day. Assyria existed up until 600 BC, prior to their downfall, but we've survived all these years later. Assyria is made up of modern day Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. And depending on where your family comes from, it's going to have a lot of influence. My dad's family ended up leaving Iraq in the mid-1970s to escape the Iraq-Iranian War. And I think our food reflects that just because I think potato chop is eaten in a lot of Iraqi homes as well. The name has an interesting story upon research, but I think it does make a lot of sense. Because even though Assyrians call potatoes kirtope, the name for potato either comes from the Arabic word or they changed the name to accommodate the British when they came to colonize Iraq in World War I. And then chop actually translates to chapa in Assyrian, which is to clap because of the clapping motion that you make when you form the patties. Potato chop is a crispy fried potato dough with a ground beef filling. And I think the appeal here is the texture because when you take a bite, you get the crispiness and the softness of the mashed potato, and then you're hit with the salt and the flavor of the filling. This dish reminds me of my Nana. She would help take care of me and my siblings growing up, and I remember this was a dish that she wouldn't make often. She was an amazing cook, but I do remember this was the only dish that I, I would ever see her get frustrated by, because sometimes the dough would break apart in the oil and she wouldn't understand why. But now we know the secret ingredient is potato flakes, but I don't think she used to use it in her recipe. After my grandma passed away, I really wanted to learn this recipe because I didn't want this to leave with her. And years after her passing, I finally attempted to make it. And when frying them, I just remember closing my eyes and smelling the potato chop in the oil. And it just had taken me back to when I was like five years old in our house, smelling them in her kitchen when she was making them. Food truly has so much power and nostalgia. It could bring a person back to a beautiful memory. And I think that's a, such a beautiful thing we can experience from time to time where if you are able to master a dish to taste similar to what a loved one has made you that who's passed away, in trying it, you just find so much joy and contentment. It's a comfort, and that's what fried food is, and especially what this dish means to me, comfort. So Beryl, as an Assyrian saying to you, for a person who's gonna eat this dish, nani lach, which means I hope you enjoy it. I would say that this dish was definitely not a beginner level dish, like maybe intermediate plus. I think that some of the skills needed for this, I have learned since doing this channel, but like it wasn't the easiest dish, but like I, I really feel like I did it. It's so nice inside. It is really, you know, like when you stuff things, you just don't know how it's really gonna turn out until you, you, you finish cooking it and break them open. Worth it. Worth the work. Worth the work. Wow. This is really good. I'm really happy. The turmeric colored the potatoes this beautiful yellow color. The ratio of this seems really good. I think that the better you are at this, the more meat to potato ratio you can have. Mine's like maybe a little more on the potato side just because I... This was my first time making it. I, I don't know who I'm making excuses for. I'm just I'm just saying some things out loud. That's what my job is right now. It's just to talk out loud to myself. <laughs> One of the tricks definitely for doing this is to make sure that everything is at least room temperature when you're doing it. Like you don't want the meat to be hot when it's going inside. You don't want the potatoes to be hot when you're trying to form them. And in this dish, I learned what a potato flake is. And so I was like Googling like, oh, I need potato flakes for this recipe. Like what is potato flakes? And all these images of boxed mashed potatoes kept coming up. That is what a potato flake is. And I think that what it did is like really help make the potatoes a dough. Because this was being deep fried and stuffed, I think it probably needed like a little bit more structural integrity. And that's what the potato flakes did. Mm. I really appreciated that Rochelle explained to us what Assyrian culture was and how it related to her and her family. And it just so happens that tonight my friend Yasser is coming over and he is originally from Iraq. So I am going to give this to him and see what he says. Roll future tape footage. Layer, are you laughing? Oh my God. How is it? Oh my gosh. It's so good. It's like, truly reminds me of home. Yeah. <laughs> how would you say very tasty? If he hated it, I wouldn't have put it in, so yay, he liked it. 
The spice in this is really, really nice. It's soft, it's crunchy on the outside. The meat is flavorful. I think that you could also probably use lamb in this and it would be very, very good. I'm not having it with a sauce, but I think if you wanted it with yogurt, that would be good. Like I said in the beginning, there's a little bit of technique here that makes it a little bit difficult, but if you're comfortable with the idea of stuffing things, I, I mean, I would recommend this. It is, it's beautiful, just beautiful. Hi Beryl, my name is Tasia and I'm from British Columbia, Canada. And the dish I'd like to share with you today is bannock. Bannock is a fried quick bread recipe made and enjoyed by indigenous people across Canada. It is incredibly versatile, can be fried, baked, or cooked over the fire, served both sweet or savory. Bannock connects me to my Métis culture because it is enjoyed by indigenous people at family and cultural gatherings, but is made with ingredients that would have been brought to Canada by European settlers. The Métis people are an indigenous group in Canada who come from a shared heritage of French fur traders and indigenous people. It is our culture that reflects that. The language still spoken by a small number of Métis people called Michif would have been instrumental in trade and bridging the gap between these two peoples back in the day. Today, we use the flour brought over from European settlers and enjoy a delicious fried food at Pow Wow or on indigenous land by the lake at the beach in the summertime. It is a dish that makes me think of summer. When you go to the beaches here, you can often buy it fresh and hot, served with cinnamon sugar, or it's even seen in food trucks or indigenous run restaurants these days. I think that the world enjoys fried food because it's so versatile. You get soft and crunchy. It can be sweet, savory, or spicy, or a little bit of everything all at once. And I think that's why you would enjoy Bannock. Whatever you're craving, you can have it with cinnamon sugar or jam for a sweet treat. It can be a burger bun to be enjoyed with salmon, beef, or mousse, or if you're hanging out around the fire at the end of the evening in summertime with friends and want to wrap the dough around a hot dog, you can cook it over the fire that way. Either way, I hope you enjoy. Since I started this channel and asked a lot of you what recipes you would be interested in seeing, I've seen a lot of requests for indigenous fry bread or bannock. And so when Tasia submitted this, I was like, finally, we can do it. And perfect for the fried food episode. I mean, yeah, solid. The inside of this is so soft and flaky and airy. And it's really surprising because this recipe did not require yeast. There was no time where I had to like put it in the closet for a couple of hours while it rises. It was just like mix it, cook it up. And that was really nice because this is definitely the lowest stress bread I've ever made. And it turned out perfectly on my first try. There's a slight sweetness to it, but it's definitely not a sweet bread. Tasia obviously gave a lot of different options of things to eat it with, both sweet and savory. I went with jam. And if you've been watching this channel, you probably know that I only have one type of jam. And if you can tell me what flavor it is, five points. <laughs> I was reading up a bit on the Métis people, and it's one of only three indigenous tribes that is recognized in Canada. And there are a few populations of Métis here in the United States, one of them being in Montana, which kind of makes sense. It's very close to the Canadian border. But their population is pretty small. If you think about the population of Canada being around 38 million, there are only around 620,000 Métis in the country. That being said, it's really nice to be able to learn about recipes that are from the original peoples of these areas and kind of learn to appreciate them from someone from that culture, but then learn how to make it yourself at home. Food is a great way to keep memories and histories alive. If you watched my Memory Meals episode, I think that you know, you'll know exactly what I mean. These cooked up really quickly. You can see like the bottom is a beautiful brown color and then the inside is just really fluffy and soft. Some of them while I was cooking them started to like bleh out like a tongue and all the dough that was raw started coming out. So I just kind of like tipped them on their side. The leaning tower of bannock. I don't get the feeling though that making bannock is all about having like the perfect shape. So I think that, that it's okay. 
As a reminder, all of the recipes that I am using are always in the description, plus a lot of other fun and interesting info. I am not somebody who sleeps on my descriptions on YouTube, just to say. Hi everyone, my name is Daniela and I am from Porto, Portugal. The dish I want to share with everyone today is called Batanishkas de Bacalhau, which translates to codfish batanishkas. This is one of the many dishes that we serve in Portugal using codfish. Everyone who has ever been to Portugal has probably re realized that codfish is almost like a religion for us here, and patanishkas are actually one of the easiest ones to make. It's just some codfish, eggs, onion, and parsley, and of course, they are fried. They are pretty much codfish fritters, however, the way you shape them can be very personal. My favorite way was always the way my grandma used to make them for me, which was very thick pancakes with large onion chunks and lots and lots of parsley. Because they were fried, my grandma would even do something extra, which was halfway cooking the patanishkas, she would put some extra egg batter around them to make them extra crunchy. And I think that's probably the reason why most people like uh, in fried food, it's the crunch factor. Uh, but the nishkas can be served for lunch, dinner, or an appetizer, just as is, at picnics, uh, inside some white bread, or even my favorite way to have them is served together with a runny tomato and beans rice, and then putting some extra vinegar on top of them. Um, this, uh, I think everyone should try this dish because it's a piece of Portuguese cuisine not a lot of people know about and they're very easy to make and super delicious. So I hope you enjoy it if you do end up trying it and thank you Beryl for reaching out. I'm really into the nautical theme that I did for the final plating for this. Um, you know, I was really channeling the docks of Portugal and where the cod was fished from. <laughs> I have made cod fritters before from Jamaica. Interestingly enough, like it's the same but different. In Jamaica, there were scotch bonnet chili peppers in them. Here, it's just kind of like a much more simple presentation with some herbs. Just gonna put a little lemon on. Mm, man, these are very nice. I feel like I'm like immediately transported somewhere else. The flavor of a cod fritter just like makes you feel kind of relaxed. I don't know why. Have I, I must have had a cod fritter somewhere where I was relaxed and like the back of my mind whenever I taste it, it like takes me back to that spot. Comparing these to the dish from Tanzania, these are much more dense in the inside. The cod and the flour and the egg, it like combines to make a thick fritter. They're not as spongy and light, but also because of that, like you really taste the cod, I think. To make these, I use salted cod and that cod is preserved. And the nice thing about it is that you can buy it and it will keep for a very long time. One thing you do wanna watch out for if you're using the salted cod is to not re-salt it once you've desalted it, because I think in general, it kind of retains a little bit of saltiness. I, like I would just taste it before you add too much salt. Just give it like a little, a little taste. Otherwise you might end up with salt mouth. No one likes salt mouth. The fish flavor is very demure. And so I think almost anybody would like this. You don't need to be somebody who's an adventurous eater to really enjoy the flavors of this. It's a very delicate tasting fish, but then because it's fried and because there's a little bit of seasoning inside and the lemon juice on top, I think it just makes for like a very easy to eat and easy to enjoy food. I will say that while this was being cooked, the kitchen stunk. <laughs> it smelled like a fish and chips shop that, I mean, I assume it smelled like a fish and chip shop. I haven't really spent much time in one, but like, I'm pretty sure that my kitchen smelled like one. The smell dissipated rather quickly and was replaced by the smell of frying, which actually might also be what a fish and chips shop smells like. Maybe my place just smells like a fish and chip shop. But there are worse things. I wanna say that I bought that little deep fryer a little over a year and a half ago for olibolin, which was the first fried food I ever made. And I thought, mm, maybe I'll use it once. Having a deep fryer in your house opens up 
a world of possibilities to you. And like, I never thought it was somebody who was like, oh, I just always want to be deep frying, but I love it. I just love having it. And this episode was joyful for me to make. I had so much fun. I enjoyed everything so much. I am really excited for the next episode. So as a reminder, if there is a dish that like really needs to be in it, leave a comment, send me an email. Let's get that fried food out there to the world. <laughs> Since you're here, I have two videos to recommend to you. Number one, my snacks video, and this video about oatmeal toppings because it has changed many lives. Uh, and maybe your life might wanna be changed for oatmeal as well. <laughs> I will see you guys next week.